I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 as we close this teaching series today, Stories of Faith. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to begin in verse 18 through the end of the chapter. What we're going to see, what we're going to see is there are four stories in this section of scripture, four different stories of faith, four stories of faith. The main idea that we're going to press in is have courage, Jesus sees you. Have courage, Jesus sees you. Don't necessarily know what each of you are going through. I don't know what challenge you're being faced with, what problem you're uh, trying to solve, or uh, what need that you are lacking and waiting on the provision. Uh, but I believe that as we look to the scriptures, we are reminded to take courage uh, because Jesus, he sees us. And Jesus just doesn't see us but Jesus cares like no one else will ever care. Have courage. Jesus sees you. This morning during the earlier hours, I received a phone call from one of the partners of Discovery. And she asked uh, for me to call her when I had the opportunity. And so I stepped out just before we started the 9 o'clock and we knew that she was, had gone to Indiana. I was with her in the hospital at Longwood a week ago Thursday. Prayed with her and her family. Her husband of 49 years had suffered a heart attack that Wednesday night prior. And was being pulled off the machines. A very difficult decision. She called me this morning. The celebration of life for D is tomorrow. The visitation is today. She was on her way to Indiana on Tuesday. When on Monday of this week, she received news that one of her sons had died. And so, when we consider the text before us and consider this life of faith can't think of a better message for you, Cindy, than to have courage that Jesus sees you. Can we, can we lift up Cindy and her family together as the church? Would you pray with me? Don't listen to me pray. Would you pray? Pray for her. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We're thankful that this will be called a house of prayer, and, and, and we're thankful that uh, that as a church, we can come around our, our sister, even from a distance, knowing that you are present right beside her, knowing that you see her, knowing that you see the, the problems and the challenges and the, the grief that she's experiencing. And Father, we pray that she would rest in your loving arms today, that she would find comfort and courage and you the Savior. And so Lord we pray for wisdom and guidance. And all that she needs. To not just, to not just make it through uh, this uh, celebration of life tomorrow. But also then on Thursday. And so God we pray for your comfort. You are the God of all comfort. We pray that you would comfort her. Lord you are the Prince of Peace. Peace that you offer is not of this world. It's a supernatural peace. And so we pray for your peace to fall fresh even now. Thank you that we can come before you with, with boldness, confidence in the finished work of Jesus. Not because of anything we bring to the table. But Lord, we lift up our sister, her family to you. Now as we open up your word once again, as it's already been prayed, Lord Jesus, say what you want to say today. Help us to have open ears, open hearts to receive, and then help us to live out your scriptures, to be doers of your word. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Have courage, Jesus sees you. Have courage, Jesus sees you. Matthew chapter 
9, beginning in verse 18, as he was telling them these things, suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down before him saying, my daughter just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will, and she will live. My daughter just died, but come lay your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus and his disciples got up and followed him. Jesus and his disciples got up and they followed him as, Je- as, as he was telling, as Jesus was telling these things. As we walk through the gospels, we see often the dispute between the religious leaders of the day and Jesus. The religious leaders of the day were, were holding fast to the law and Jesus is, is saying, I've come to fulfill the law. And the, the religious leaders of the day were all about the external. Man, you better look the part. I, I mean, you better know the part. And Jesus was saying, the part better be within you and then transform from the inside outside. Suddenly, one of the leaders came and knelt down before him. One of the leaders, one of the religious leaders, one of the, the synagogue leaders, his name is Jairus. We see that in the, the account in Mark, Mark chapter five. Mark chapter five is the account of, of Jairus where it's, his name is his name, Jairus. He's the religious leader of that synagogue that, that listens to Jesus. He's observed Jesus. He's heard the stories. There's something about Jesus that he must come and must ask that my daughter is, is dead. Will you come? Because there's something about you. There's some significance about you. There's power about you. You're a miracle worker. Will you come? And what does he do? His, his first response is to kneel down before he then asks anything of our Lord. He kneels down. He kneels down and worships him. That's the posture of worship. All throughout the Old Testament, we see this word worship. Worship the Lord with gladness. Psalm 100 verse 2 says, worship the Lord with gladness. The, the real meaning in the Hebrew is to literally bow oneself down lowly to the ground. Why is that? Out of respect, out of fear, out of Reference out of all of who God is, we're bowing ourselves, we're taking that humble position of worship. And so this leader of the synagogue bows down before him. This man worshiped him, which would have been, by the way, blasphemous if Jesus had not himself been God. So then he makes his request, my daughter just died, but come and lay your hand on her. She will live. So Jesus and disciples got up and followed him. That's the first story. There's an interjection here of a second story. And the first story will resume in just a moment. So stay with me. Verse 20. Hopefully you have your Bibles open. Verse 20. Just then, just then, a woman had suffered from bleeding for 12 years, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. For she said to herself, she said to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be made well. Jesus turned, and what do we see? And saw her. Jesus turned and saw her. Have courage, daughter, he said. Your faith has saved you. And the woman was made well from that moment. The woman was made well from that moment. So Jesus and his disciples get up. Jairus has just come over, bowed down, bowed down before him, knelt down before him, made his request. Jesus' disciples get up and follow him. It's interesting that this woman was observing all of this. She waited for the very moment that Jesus would stand up and would move. Why? She waited for the very moment that there would be a little bit of chaos injected in in the streets. She didn't want to be seen. She says, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be made well. This woman, so much faith, knowing the power, the living power of our Savior. If I can just touch his robe... I'll be made well. Robert Smith's mama told him growing up that Jesus had more medicine in the hem of his garment than all the drugstores in town. Heard that a few weeks ago. Man, I had to write that down. (laughs) Never forget that. Jesus had more medicine in the hem of his garment, the end of his robe, than all the drugstores in town. 
She said to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be made well. Charles Spurgeon said this, she was ignorant enough to think that healing went from him unconsciously. Like Jesus wouldn't know. I can just kind of quietly touch his robe, you know. Maybe there won't be a scene. Oh, she's, she's, she was sadly mistaken. She was ignorant enough, Spurgeon says, uh, to think that healing went from him unconsciously, yet her faith, yet her faith lived despite her ignorance and triumphed despite her bashfulness. Yet her faith lived, her faith lived despite her ignorance and triumphed despite her bashfulness. Verse 22, Jesus turned and saw her. What an encouragement for us today. Jesus turns and he sees her. The one who sees, sees you. You might be sitting there thinking, oh, nobody else knows. Nobody else sees. Nobody knows the, the trouble. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I mean, some of y'all shouting out from your living room here. And, uh, but I guarantee you, the one who sees, sees you. Jesus turned and saw her. In the midst of her pain, in the midst of her problems, in the midst of the people, Jesus sees her. Now, now, we don't know her name. I wish we knew her name, but I'm glad that we don't find her name here written in this account because for many of us, that will be of extreme encouragement. That here's a, 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 a no-name woman who's been struggling for all these years. She, she's had to live uh, mainly in isolation. She's had to live in pain. She's had to live as culturally speaking unclean. But, but Jesus turned and saw her that day. I said, have courage, daughter. Have courage, daughter. He said, your faith has saved you. It's interesting that in no, nowhere else in the gospels do we see Jesus refer to any other woman as daughter. He turned to her and he says, have courage, daughter. He said, your faith has saved you. Listen, this woman, this woman hoped to uh, receive something from Jesus without drawing any attention to herself. She, she looked for the moment that Jesus stood up, the disciples stood up, there was a little bit of chaos, there was a little, you know, there was a crowd, there was noise, there was clutter, and, and just sneak right in there, just quickly, if I can just touch his robe. And Jesus makes this point. Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Jesus spoke these words aloud so she would know. Firstly, she would know that she was healed. Secondly, so others would know that she was healed. Uh, thirdly, thirdly, so, so she would know why. She would know why she was healed. That it was by her faith and, and not a superstitious touch. She did it so that that, that Jairus, the, the leader of the synagogue, would see the power of Jesus at work and have more faith himself for his dying daughter. He did it so that he could bless her in this very special way, giving her an honored title. Again, that we never see Jesus use again. Daughter. Daughter. Could you imagine being this woman? Living all these years with this problem, feeling as if no one else can relate. I could just sneak in, just touch the hem of his garment, the end of his robe, I might be healed. And Jesus makes this point to the crowd that day that her faith has saved her. Your faith has saved you. And the woman was made well. Her faith 
though imperfect, much like your faith and my faith, there's, there's no perfect faith. I, I hope and pray that we have a greater faith today than we did yesterday. I pray that we're moving, taking little steps. Some of y'all want to, want to, 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 to make leaps and bounds, but, but can I just encourage you? Take little healthy steps. Could it be the prayer of your prayer, my prayer each day, God, Help me to love you more this day than I did yesterday. Help me to live for you more this day than I did, did yesterday. Help me to know you better this day than I, than I did yesterday. The woman was made well. Her faith, though imperfect, was enough to receive what Jesus wanted to give her. Her 12-year problem was immediately cured. I don't know what problem, how extensive in the time frame that some of you have been battling. But in an instant, we see that our God is able, that with him and through him, all things are possible, that Jesus is the miracle worker. And some of you have been running and you've been running and you've been running You've been trying everything else but him. You've been running in all kinds of places but him. And today, can I encourage you and challenge you? Can I plead with you and beg to come home? Just get a touch of his robe. Just one touch of his robe could change everything. Look back to verse 23. When Jesus came to the leader's house, he saw again. He saw. This time, though, he sees the flute players and crowd lamenting loudly. And some of y'all are like, what in the world? Jesus arrived in this house and there's flutes and people crying. I, mean, I get the people crying, but the flutes. Leave, he said, because the girl is not dead but asleep. And they laughed at him. Can you imagine? <laughs> Being Jesus, I mean, you don't know who you're laughing at. I'd be careful, right? I'd be careful. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the, and the girl got up. Then the news of this spread throughout the whole, the whole area. And so Jesus, after this woman has been made well, Jesus and the disciples make their way over to Jairus' home and he sees the flute players and crowd lamenting loudly. Biblical scholars agree that these were probably paid mourners. They were probably paid mourners. Professional mourners were, were hired even by the poorest of families. The Jewish Mishnah uh, specifies that not less than two flutes and one wailing woman Whenever one dies, call in not less than two flutes and one wailing woman. Why? Because there should be this, this, this scene. There should be the scene. And so Jesus arrives on the scene. And what does he do? Now he ushers them all out. He said, this, this girl isn't dead. Hold on. Have courage. Jesus sees. takes her by the hand. The girl got up. The news of this spread throughout the whole area. Stories one and two. Verse 27, story three. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him. Two blind men calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men approached him and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I can do this? <laughs> Do you believe that I can do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, let it be done for you according to your faith. Let it be done for you according to your faith. And their eyes were open. Their eyes were open. Then Jesus warned them sternly. Be sure that no one finds out, verse 31, but they, they went out and spread the news about him throughout that whole area. Third story of faith. Jesus heals two blind men. They asked Jesus, 
the blind men asked Jesus for the very best thing that they could ask for. And what was it? Mercy. Mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Mercy is not getting what, what we deserve. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and what does he remind them of? That, 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 that God is, the, is rich in mercy. Not getting, not getting what, we, what we deserve. They cry out for mercy. Have mercy on us, son of David. Do you see that in your Bibles? Son of David, this is a rich messianic title. A rich messianic title. This is the first time Jesus is called, by the way, son of David. And there can be no doubt that the blind men were confessing Jesus as the Messiah. They believed in him. They knew what he was capable of. Do you believe that I can do this? They said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. What a simple response. Yes, Lord. He touched their eyes. Let it be done for you according to your faith. Matthew reveals the kind of faith that we should have in Jesus and the blessings that come to us through faith. In Matthew chapter 8, we have seen that the leper showed faith because he absolutely knew that Jesus was able to heal his leprosy. Also in Matthew chapter 8, the centurion, do you recall, had such a great faith that, that Jesus openly praised his great faith that he had not found among the people of Israel. Then, as you continue reading, the disciples did not have a great faith. They failed in their faith. The storm arises on the Sea of Galilee and they wake Jesus up. And why do you have such little faith? The woman with this blood issue for all these years was healed by her, by her faith. And in many ways, God says the same to men and, and, and women today. According to your faith, and I wonder... Where's your faith? Consider your faith today in the living God. The two blind men had the faith to follow Jesus. The two blind men had the faith to follow Jesus. This meant forsaking other paths, other directions, and deciding to follow him. And what a word for you and I today. If we're wavering any bit, stop wavering. Trust him completely. Follow him, forsake all, all of the things, all of the paths, all of the directions, and follow him. The, the blind men, they, they had the faith to cry out, willing to put words to their desires. Can you imagine that day? Have mercy on us, son of David. They cry out. They had a, a faith to cry out. They had a faith to make noise and, and be unafraid of, an, of embarrassment. They, they had faith to identify Jesus as the son of, of David, recognizing him as the Messiah. They had faith to ask Jesus for mercy, knowing they didn't deserve healing. They had the faith to believe that Jesus was able to heal them. And lastly, these two blind men had the faith to say a simple, yes, Lord. I wonder, what is it that Jesus is asking you today? Yes, Lord. Verse 32, would you look to the scriptures? The fourth story of faith today. Just as they were going out, a demon-possessed man who was unable to speak was brought to him. When the demon had been driven out, the man who had been mute and the crowds, the man who had been mute spoke and the crowds were amazed saying nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. Third story of faith. We see in verse 32 that there's this mute demon possessed man who was brought to Jesus. Someone or some group of people had faith in Jesus. Enough faith to bring this man to him. Don't, don't miss this. 
this demon-possessed mute man needed someone to bring him to Jesus. And here's a person or a group of people that had enough faith, enough faith to bring him to Jesus. What a faith. In the Jewish understanding of demon possession, this man could not be helped. Most rabbis of that day thought that the first step in exorcism was to trick the demon into telling its name. The name was then thought of as a, as a, a handle of sorts, a, a handle by which the demon could then be removed. A demon that made a man mute had cleverly prevented the revelation of its name and therefore prevented the exorcism. Yet, Jesus had no problem. The demon was cast out and the mute man spoke. And then notice the response, verse 33. The crowds were amazed. The crowds were amazed. As I read that text, I couldn't stop thinking. Were the crowds, were they amazed by the miracle? Or were they amazed by the miracle worker? We're living in times that the miracles are so attractive. People are flocking. People are giving everything for the, for the miracles. But what about the miracle worker? May we never forget the miracles are only accomplished by the power of Jesus. It's the power of Jesus and Jesus alone. And I say this because for some of you today, whether in the house or online, you're holding out, believing and waiting for the miracle. And I pray that the miracle comes. Sincerely, I pray that the miracle comes. But the question to consider is, what if the miracle never comes? Will we still believe Jesus is able? Will we still believe that he's all powerful? Because here's the hope. The greatest hope for the believer is not necessarily the miracle this side of heaven. The greatest hope for the, for the believer is heaven. When we will no longer, when we are no longer, face death sorrow the brokenness of this world the pain of this world the greatest hope for the believer is heaven and I wonder today where is your where's your faith notice in verse 33 the crowds were amazed what are they saying nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel Nothing, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. The miracle showed not only the complete authority of, of Jesus over the demonic realm, but also the weakness of the, the rabbi's traditions. Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees, they weren't far away. They, 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 they were witnessing all of this and they were looking for their moment. To dispel the Savior. He drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. Do you hear their response? The, the religious leaders of the day rejected Jesus by attributing his work to Satan. Look to verse 35. Jesus Continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. I shared many weeks ago that two thirds of Jesus's earthly ministry centered around the Sea of Galilee. When I visit the Holy Land, I, I, I try to take it in. I try to just picture Jesus, you know, walking on the water. I just try to picture Jesus and all these miracles that, that we read, the accounts that we have performing all of these different miracles. But two-thirds of Jesus' earthly ministry centered around the Sea of Galilee. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them 
because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Note this. Verse 36, when he saw, do you see that again? The one who sees, sees you. Have courage. Jesus sees you. When he saw the crowds, what did he feel? Compassion. What does that word compassion mean? It's, 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 it's actually an intriguing word. It's a beautiful word. Oh, that the church might be filled with compassion like Jesus. This word compassion means to, to literally, it's, it's, it's a moving within your gut. Have you ever seen someone in a painful moment of life and, and something moves within you, that's compassion. And if not, maybe, maybe pray for compassion. <laughs> God, when I, when I see people broken, what, what's my first thought? What's my first reaction? And if it's not compassion, Lord, help me. Help me to be filled with compassion. What led that person to, to do what they're doing or to stay where they're at or, you know, living in this kind of a way? May we be filled with compassion. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion because they were distressed, dejected like sheep without a shepherd. I want to challenge us as the church. We have to see what Jesus sees. Feel what Jesus feels. And do what Jesus says to do. Let me say that again for the church. Those that have ears to hear. We have to see what Jesus sees. Feel what Jesus feels. And do what Jesus says. He felt compassion. He said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray. Therefore, pray. Because this, this harvest is plentiful, it's, it's abundant, and the works are free, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Note the, the last story of faith, the fourth story of faith. Someone or some people, again, brought this demon-possessed mute man to Jesus and I wonder today who are you bringing to Jesus consider the person that brought you to Jesus maybe it's been a while since you've thought about that and so you just need a little revival in that area to thank God for placing that person in his sovereignty in your life at that moment exact moment of time to bring you to Jesus maybe it's been a while since you picked up that phone and you've called him and said hey thank you for bringing me to Jesus but there needs to be a little bit of a revival that, that needs to happen in your life because you forgot maybe you've forgotten what it was like to be lost to be like one of these that Jesus saw dejected distressed like sheep without a shepherd some of y'all been saved for so long, you've forgotten what it's like to be lost. Forgotten what it's like to live without no hope. Forgotten what it's like to be one step away from the fiery pits of hell. And we just need to say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And help me to participate in your kingdom work. You know, there's a, a misconception that it's the pastor's job to go out and do all of this and all of that. Can I tell you, if that's your thinking, it is dead wrong. It's the pastor's job to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and together we go. Together we go. At our partnership lunch last week, I told those that attended what a, what a wonderful time it was. Eight people around a table talking about expectations and responsibilities of a partner. I told our church that, that we will never ask you to do something that Audra and I are not willing to do ourselves. We, we, will, 
We will strive our best and at times we will fail. But we will strive our best to lead well and to love well. To lead you into the ways of the Lord. To live out these holy scriptures. To call you to be the church. And so if you're looking for a church, if you're looking for like just a comfortable church, hey, discovery is not going to be the church for you. I know that's not like the best, like, you know, how do we grow and in, in, in all of that? But it all belongs to God. I'm going to trust him. Trust him for 15 years. We're going to continue to trust him. And so if that's what you're looking for, it's not here. And if that's what you're looking for, don't try to bring it here. But we're going to be a church that is committed to the cause of Christ. We're going to be a church that's committed to being compassionate, to seeing people as God sees them, to draw a line in the sand and call sin, sin. But there's a savior who has come. And so will you pray for laborers? And will you participate in this kingdom work? As we close today and prepare to take these communion elements. If you're online with us, you might want to gather some kind of juice, some kind of cracker. But first John chapter four, first John chapter four, and we have seen and we have testified and we testify. We have seen and we testify that the father has sent his son as the world's savior. The father has sent the son as the world savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Do you believe it? That overwhelming, unconditional, unending love of God. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. In this love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. We have confidence, not in ourselves, not in anything good we can do, but in the finished work of the cross. That is where our confidence lies. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love, perfect love, Drives out fear. Have you experienced his perfect love? Drives out fear. Because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to ask you to come to one of these corners. If you're in the house, of course, I'm going to ask you to come to one of these corners and I'm going to ask you to take, uh, to take the bread, to take the juice and to take it back to your seat and reflect for a moment. Remember the great sacrifice of our Savior. Take time for a revival. Draw a circle around yourself and say, God, revive me. Remind me of what I've been saved from and what I've been saved for. Do a special work. Make this a holy moment between you and the Savior. Reflect on his goodness that we've sung about. Reflect on his great sacrifice that the Lord Jesus accomplished for you and I, for the world, what we could not accomplish for ourselves. Paid in full. His body was broken and his blood was shed. And when you feel that you have thanked him sufficiently. <laughs> you have praised him because he's worthy. Then I'm going to encourage you to, to take those elements and then praise him through song. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place and, and those that are online with us. Before we take this communion, by the way, it is an open communion here at Discovery, meaning if you, are, you don't have to be a partner of this church, the requirement is that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have been saved and set free, transformed, that the Spirit of God dwells in you, and your hope is in heaven. Your faith is in the Savior. 
That's who this offering time is, uh, this, this communion time is for. And so I wonder, all across this place, those don't lie if there's one here today that is struggling. You came in wondering, does anybody see you? You, you, you came in with, with anything but courage. You came in ready to give up, but you've been reminded through the word of God today that, that he sees you, that he cares for you, that you are valuable. We are called sons and daughters adopted into this family of faith because of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And so would you thank him? Would you come home? Would you recommit to follow him, live for him, to know his word, to have a great faith in him? As you're praying and you're thanking him, perhaps there's one in the house or online that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus for salvation. And today would be the day, today would be the day that changes everything. Today would be the day that you reach out and accept the greatest gift that is salvation, been paid for. Would you reach out and accept it today? The Spirit of God is moving in your life. Would you say, dear Jesus, confess him as Lord as the word tells us to. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. You are the Savior. I repent of all my sins. And I trust you completely. I will follow you all the days of my life. I believe in you. Would you tell him? This is your prayer. I believe in you. You came to this earth, died on a cross, placed in a grave, rose victorious for me, for the world. So today, I receive the greatest gift, which is salvation in Christ Jesus alone. Thank you for saving me. Lord Jesus, have your way in this moment. Help us to properly remember, reflect, and to worship you. For you are worthy. You are worthy. In the wonderful name of Jesus.